right, everyone. Welcome back. This is Faye. And this is Nick. And this is Kriag's Over, Over Coffee. Coffee. Today's topic will be treatment options for vasomotor symptoms of menopause. And joining us today is Dr. Renee Eager, who is an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the Warren Albert Medical School of Brown University. Welcome, Dr. Eager. Thank you. All right, so today, as Faye said, we're going to talk all about menopause, so we've defined a couple learning objectives. First, we'll define menopause, then we're going to identify cardinal signs and symptoms of menopause. Next, we'll identify non-hormonal treatment options for the vasomotor symptoms of menopause. Then we'll go on to the FDA-approved indications for the use of hormone replacement therapy. And finally, we'll discuss prescribing options for HRT. So let's jump right in. Dr. Eager, can you tell us a little bit more about what exactly menopause is and why should we care as OBGYNs? On average, um, women spend over one-third of their lives in menopause, so having a good understanding of this phase in a woman's life is important for an OBGYN to know. Menopause is the permanent cessation of menstruation occurring after one year of no menses. In North America, the median age of menopause is 51. Dr. Eager, what can clue us in? What are the cardinal signs and symptoms of menopause? Well, there are ones that you've obviously read about previously, such as vasomotor symptoms, um, vulvovaginal atrophy, and concomitant urinary symptoms. But in addition, women experience sleep disturbances and occasionally adverse mood changes. So vasomotor symptoms, to start with those, are often called hot flashes or hot flushes or night sweats. They are sudden episodes of intense heat, which usually starts in the chest or the face, then spreads um, through the body. These events are usually accompanied by sweating, flushing, chills, clamminess, anxiety, and occasional heart palpitations, pretty much misery. So hot flashes can interfere with sleep, causing chronic sleep disturbances. A typical hot flash will last anywhere from one to five minutes. The symptoms often begin during what we call the menopausal transition, which is when there is a decline in estrogen levels, but not yet a complete absence. Up to 80% of women in menopause or the menopause transition will experience vasomotor symptoms. Symptoms last on average for seven years, although the frequency and the intensity of symptoms may decline over time. That sounds awful but I guess at least mercifully short-lived, only one to five minutes. We've also noticed that there are ethnic and racial differences in the frequency and the severity of symptoms. The study of women across America, which is often referred to as the SWAN study, was published in 2001 and assessed menopausal symptoms in over 14,000 women who had diverse ethnic backgrounds in the United States. What was found was that African-American women were most likely to report symptoms and most likely to report their symptoms as being bothersome. Asian-American women, on the flip side, were the least likely to report symptoms and are less likely to report their symptoms as being bothersome. So what causes these vasomotor symptoms? Or I guess, what, are, what is the pathophysiology of all of this? So a lot of people have spent a long time trying to figure that out, and the bottom line is um, they're not fully understood. We know that changes in hormone levels are critical. Thermoregulatory changes occur, and hot flash flashes are actually believed to be thermoregulatory heat dissipation events, but the exact mechanism is not entirely known. The thermoneutral zone in the hypothalamus is narrowed when, in women who have vasomotor symptoms. And this is the area of the brain where core body temperature is maintained without triggering thermoregulatory homeostatic mechanisms such as sweating or shivering. In symptomatic women, small fluctuations in core body temperature um, can exceed this zone, and it triggers a heat dissipation mechanism such as sweating and peripheral dilation, and that is what the patient experiences as a hot flash. The use of estrogen widens this thermoneutral zone, and, and, and therefore it reduces vasomotor symptoms. So, Dr. Eager, moving on from hot flushes, what about vulvovaginal atrophy symptoms in menopause? I find that a lot of my own patients are struggling with 
So vulval vaginal atrophy is a symptom or a sign of menopause that actually has been renamed as being the genitourinary syndrome of menopause for a couple of reasons. It was renamed because it more accurately reflected um, the actual symptoms that patients experience and in addition was felt to be a sort of socially more acceptable terminology to be using when describing those symptoms. Vulval vaginal atrophy or genitourinary syndrome of menopause um, is another well-documented consequence of the hypoestrogenic state associated with menopause. The symptoms of this include vaginal dryness, itching, irritation, dyspareunia, urinary symptoms, or dysuria and frequent UTIs. And it seems like they're pretty frequent in women as well. Yes, they are. There's a a prevalence of about 10 to 40 percent of menopausal women will experience genitourinary syndrome. And what actually causes this? So the cause of these symptoms is lower estrogen levels, which leads to a loss of superficial epithelial cells in the genitourinary tract, and that in turn leads to thinning. The loss of vaginal rugae and elasticity occurs as a result of this. There's narrowing and shortening of the vagina, and a consequence of this is tearing and bleeding. There's also a loss of subcutaneous fat in the labia majora, resulting in narrowing of the introitus, a fusion of the labia minora, a shrinking of the clitoral prepuce and urethra, and the vaginal pH increases, which alters vaginal flora, placing the vagina at risk for infections. The vaginal walls decrease the production of vaginal secretions, and that in turn leads to dyspareunia. So now that we've kind of gone over all the symptoms and signs of menopause and we've defined it, I think we should get into the meat of this topic, which is the treatment options for these vasomotor symptoms. Can you talk to us a little bit about the different types of of treatments? So lifestyle modifications are really an appropriate first step in addressing vasomotor symptoms. This can involve something as simple as controlling the surrounding environment as much as possible. So keeping a room cool, especially while sleeping, is a first step. Dressing in layers, drinking cool drinks, using portable fans, and avoiding personally identified triggers such as alcohol or spicy food. Weight loss can be helpful as obesity has been shown to be associated with an increased frequency of vasomotor symptoms. That being said, aerobic exercise per se has actually not shown consistent decreases um, in vasomotor symptoms. Other non-pharmacologic therapies um, have been identified, can show some possible benefit. These can include paced respiration, which is a type of slow, deep breathing that requires specific clinical training, clinical hypnosis, cognitive behavioral therapy, and mindfulness-based stress reduction. So, Doctor, you're moving beyond these lifestyle modifications. What if we have a patient that tries these and it's just not enough? or they're looking towards getting on a medication and maybe they're not the best candidate for hormone replacement therapy um, when we talk about that later, what are some other pharmacologic options that we might have to be able to use? So most pharmacologic agents used to treat vasomotor symptoms are actually prescribed um, off-label. The only prescribed non-hormonal treatment for vasomotor symptoms that has received FDA approval for this indication is paroxetine, 7.5 milligrams. Um, Paroxetine is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or an SSRI. And SSRIs have shown efficacy in a number of randomized controlled trials. Um, Patients get relief usually within the first week, as opposed to patients who are using it for the purposes of treatment of depression where it can take longer. Paroxetine in clinical trials has reduced hot flashes by over 60% compared with the 38% reduction using a placebo. Other SSRIs such as fluoxetine and escitalopram and venlafaxine, which is an SNRI, have shown efficacy in reducing vasomotor symptoms as well. Gabapentin is a gamma aminobutyric acid analog, which has been shown to reduce hot flush frequency and severity by 40 to 50 percent, compared with a 30 percent reduction with placebos. Side effects of gabapentin can include dizziness, drowsiness, and disorientation. I find that it's particularly helpful for patients uh, with night sweats and poor sleep. The drowsiness associated with its use typically improves within about two to three weeks of initiation of therapy. The mechanism of action is unclear, but it may relate to an increased activity of neurotransmitters in the hypothalamus. 
And finally, clonidine is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist, um, which may help vasomotor symptoms by reducing peripheral vascular reactivity. It may also act centrally by lowering hypothalamic norepinephrine levels and raising the sweating threshold in symptomatic women. Side effects for clonidine would include dry mouth, insomnia, and postural hypotension. Great. So I think that's all the time that we have for today in terms of talking about menopause, vasomotor symptoms, and the non-pharmacologic treatments, um, as well as the non-hormonal pharmacologic treatments. That being said, let's go ahead and summarize. Sounds great. So we start off this episode with Dr. Eager describing to us that we all should care about menopause. Women spend a third of their lives in menopause. It's an important thing for us to really have a good fundamental understanding of. We also define menopause as the permanent cessation of menses occurring after one year. In North America, the median age is 51. We also discuss some of the cardinal signs and symptoms of menopause. These are things like vasomotor symptoms, things like hot flashes or night sweats. We talked about vulvovaginal atrophy or the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, as well as sleep disturbances and adverse moods. Then we talked about lifestyle modifications as an appropriate first step in reducing these vasomotor symptoms of menopause. A lot of these focus on surrounding the controlling environment, so things like portable fans, dressing in layers, keeping the ambient temperature of the room cooler. And finally, we touched on the non-hormonal pharmacologic agents, things like paroxetine, which is an SSRI. Um, we also talked about things like fluoxetine, escitalopram, and venlafaxine. We finally touched a little bit on gabapentin as well as clonidine in the treatment of vasomotor symptoms. All right, and once again, I'm Nick. This is Faye. And this has been Creogs Over Coffee. So guys, if you like what we had to say on this podcast today, you can go on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts and give us a rating and review. Be sure to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook at Creogs Over Coffee. We're on Twitter at Creogs Over Coffee 1. And you can visit our website for more resources at www.creogsovercoffee.com. And finally, if you have any suggestions or any topics that you'd like to hear, you can email us at creogsovercoffee at gmail.com. Mm-hmm.